M S W Media. I just want to find 11,780 votes. The Fulton County Grand Jury investigation of Donald Trump. What proves fact A, fact B, and fact C? If we can do that, I'm going to bring an indictment. I'm Bill Rankin. I'm Tamar Hallerman. Join us for Season 9 of Breakdown from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Listen now, and please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Lomi for supporting the Daily Beans. Start making a positive impact on the environment with a Lomi home composter. Get $50 off when you go to Lomi.com slash Daily Beans and use code Daily Beans. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Thursday, November 17th, 2022. Today, a same-sex and interracial marriage bill passed a procedural hurdle in the Senate. I'll tell you what it does and what it doesn't do. Congress has also passed the Speak Out Act, barring NDAs and instances of sexual harassment and assault. The Pentagon reports it was not a Russian missile that hit a grain processing plant in Poland, but that Russia bears the ultimate responsibility. The turtle is reelected as the Senate minority leader, but not unanimously. The Fulton County DA is mulling limited immunity for some of the fraudulent electors to compel their testimony. And we are likely to get our first woman Senate president pro tem. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everybody. How are you? It's AG. So Dana's out again today, but she will be back tomorrow. I promise. And I miss her and I love her. And I know you do, too. Later on in the show, though, I'm going to be talking to the host of the Living Through It podcast and the author of the book Becoming Heroines, Elizabeth Cronice McLaughlin. And her and I are going to be recording a really cool joint episode on the election that we are going to air the Friday after Thanksgiving. So I look forward to that and the discussion with her as well. We have a lot of news to get to. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. So I'm going to read this exclusive reporting from CNN, but with the caveat that I do not like the framing. Now, before I get into it, the headline is that Fonnie Willis is weighing limited immunity for some of the fraudulent electors in Georgia so that she can compel their testimony because a few of them are being little assholes. So to give you an example of how I think the framing of an immunity story should go, let me read to you from The Guardian about when the Department of Justice granted Kosh Patel limited use immunity in the documents case, the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Their framing goes like this, quote, Patel testified before the grand jury after the Justice Department this week granted him limited immunity, which guaranteed he would not be prosecuted in the criminal investigation over his statements, nor would information be derived from them. The move to immunize Patel reflects the importance of his testimony about the purported declassification and appears to reflect a decision to forego a potential case against him in order to secure evidence against a bigger target such as Trump. Now, let me read you what CNN says about the Georgia fraudulent electors immunity. They say, quote, the Atlanta area prosecutor investigating Donald Trump and his allies has hit a roadblock in her effort to gain testimony from some of the state Republicans who signed on as fake electors in order to thwart Joe Biden's 2020 victory in Georgia. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis took an aggressive approach in dealing with Georgia's group of 16 GOP electors, subpoenaing at least 12 of them over the summer and labeling all of them targets who could face indictment. But that tactic appears to have undermined her ability to obtain potentially crucial testimony from the exact people who could provide inside accounts of the operation to overturn the election in Georgia, including what, if any, role the former president played. So I'm sure you can see the difference. But anyhow, Fonnie Willis is a badass and she's considering immunity for a few fake electors so she can get solid testimony against a bigger fish. Also, U.S. Senator Patty Murray will likely be the first woman to serve as Senate president pro tempore, a position that would place her third in line for the presidency. Murray will also likely chair the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee, controlling the federal purse strings and directing billions of dollars of spending. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer plans to nominate Murray, who was just elected to a sixth term to the position. That's according to Murray's office. The Senate President Pro Tem presides over the Senate in the vice president's absence. The position is third in line of the presidency, like I said, after the vice president and the House Speaker. Murray, in an interview Wednesday, called the nomination an honor. 
Quote, it's not lost on me the significance that I'll be the first woman to serve as president pro tem. I'm looking at it in terms of what I can continue to do to help accomplish things for families in Washington. The current president pro tem, Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy, is retiring after his term ends in January. The position is largely ceremonial, but does have several other responsibilities. The president pro tem, along with the House Speaker, appoints the director of the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, and appoints Senate legislative and legal counsels. Interesting. President pro tem, if the vice president is absent, can administer Senate oaths of office, sign legislation, and preside with the House Speaker over joint sessions of Congress. Senate Democrats will vote to confirm Senate leadership positions, including pro tem, the week of December 5th. Senate Republicans, in their own caucus vote on Wednesday, re-elected Turtle Dick Mitch as their minority leader. Womp womp, minority leader. Now, this is very cool. Some important legislation going through the process this week. A major hurdle for employees who want to speak out about workplace sexual harassment is poised to be removed with significant ramifications across Wall Street, which has lagged behind the rest of corporate America in scaling back nondisclosure agreements. President Joe Biden, I think I think the only group of folks that had more NDAs than Wall Street was the fucking Trump White House. So Joe Biden is expected to sign the so-called Speak Out Act after the bill was passed by the House 315 to 109 on Wednesday. Guess who the 109 were and approved. Oh, by the way, Gates was on that list of the 109 Republicans who voted no. And it was approved by the Senate in September. The new law will prohibit employers from enforcing non-disclosure agreements and non-disparagement clauses often signed on the first day of employment and sometimes unknowingly that stop workers from discussing any incidents of sexual harassment or assault occurring months or years later. The new law could have a broad impact on places like Wall Street, where all but one of the six biggest U.S. banks are run by men and issues of gender discrimination and inequality have proliferated for decades. Confidentiality agreements can still be found in employment contracts at boutique hedge funds, private equity firms, and other smaller finance firms, according to Wigder LLP partner David Gottlieb, who has represented workers at major banks, companies such as Salesforce Inc. and Microsoft Corp. Meanwhile, have limited their employee agreements to make misconduct easier to report and more transparent. Quote, It is so inane that NDAs can be this vast. That's former Fox News anchor Gretchen Carlson, an early figure in the Me Too movement. And she said that in an interview. Her policy group, Lift Our Voices, backed the bill. It's even hard to describe. You can't believe that all of these people are silenced on their first day. Also, the Senate on Wednesday narrowly advanced legislation to protect same-sex marriage, sending it to near certain passage. In a 62 to 37 vote, 12 Republicans voted with all of the Democrats to move forward on the bill after negotiators reached a bipartisan deal to include protections for religious liberty. The vote on final passage could occur as soon as this week if they get unanimous consent. Quote, we can ease the fear that millions of same sex and interracial couples have that their freedoms and their rights could be stripped away. That was Senator Tammy Baldwin, Democrat of Wisconsin, who is lead sponsor, along with Senator Susan Collins, who is very concerned. Quote, we guarantee same sex and interracial couples, regardless of where they live, that their marriage is legal. Headed into the floor vote, only a handful of Republicans, including Senators Mitt Romney, Roy Blunt and Lisa Murkowski, publicly committed to voting for the modified legislation. Okay, but Wednesday's vote showed Majority Leader Chuck Schumer might get what he hoped for when he delayed the bill to protect same sex marriage rights from coming to the floor in September, agreeing to Republican requests that the chamber take it up after the election. Hmm. Some Democrats feared they were being played, convinced to take pressure off the opposing party only to have the GOP tank the legislation later, because that's how they do. But negotiators bet that waiting would help solidify support for the bill and allow senators to vote without considering the midterms. How nice of them. Quote, I made the choice to trust the members who have worked so hard on the legislation and wait a little bit longer in order to give the bipartisan process a chance to play out. That was Chuck ahead of the vote. He said no one, no one in a same-sex marriage should have to worry about whether or not their marriage will be invalidated in the future. They deserve peace of mind knowing their rights will always be protected under the law. Baldwin, along with Kirsten Cinema, were the lead Democratic negotiators, while Collins worked with Rob Portman from Ohio, Republican, and Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina, to shore up GOP votes. During a vote, Baldwin barely stepped more than three feet away from the clerk's desk. Cinema split her time between the GOP cloakroom and the floor, like she does. And that's where she closely watched the tally. Collins at one point joked to Richard Shelby, Republican from Alaska, after he voted no, saying, you could have surprised everybody. And then she furrowed her brow again. While the House passed its same-sex marriage bill in July without support from nearly 50 House Republicans, 
The process in the Senate has taken more time amid GOP concerns about religious liberty and apparently the election. If the Senate does pass its version, the legislation will need another vote of approval from the House to head to President Joe Biden's desk. The GOP senators who supported advancing the bill include Joni Ernst, Loomis of Wyoming, Todd Young, Dan Sullivan, Shelley Moore Capito, and Richard Burr, who is retiring. The Senate bill would ensure that federal government recognizes a same-sex marriage if it were valid in a state it took, that it took place in and a couple moved to a state that didn't recognize it. It would still be valid. It would also apply to interracial marriage. It would also repeal DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, signed in 96, which defined marriage between one man and one woman under federal laws. The bipartisan amendment clarifies the bill would leave intact protections from a 1993 religious freedom law, which outlaws placing substantial burden on people's ability to exercise their religion. Uh, In addition, it states that nonprofit religious groups would not have to perform marriage services and that the bill would not impact their tax treatment. The Senate is expected to proceed now to its version that includes this religious liberty amendment. The bill's supporters want to see it pass as soon as Thursday. That would take unanimous consent, which is agreement from all 100 senators to allow it to move more quickly. I bet somebody's going to stand up against that, but we'll see. And it's important to know what this bill doesn't do. Not because I'm against this bill. We shouldn't make the perfect the enemy of the good, but we know we have more work to do. It would not require states to themselves license same-sex marriages, as the 2015 Supreme Court ruling does. And if the Supreme Court were to overturn Obergefell v. Hodges, constitutional amendments or bans on same-sex marriages would become enforceable again in at least 29 of the 50 states. That's according to a report by the Movement Advancement Project, an advocacy group that champions LGBTQ plus rights. All right, that is the news. Uh, We will be right back with Elizabeth Cronise McLaughlin, host of Living Through It and author of the book Becoming Heroines. We're going to have a great discussion, and then we'll have the good news after that. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I have wanted to start composting for the longest time, but it seems so complicated, and I didn't have the space for it. But I recently discovered Lomi. Lomi is a countertop electric composter. It's odor-free and mess-free, and it keeps your food waste out of landfills. It fits into any size kitchen, big or small, and it makes your food waste disappear in less than four hours. Lomi turns my food scraps into dirt with just the touch of a button, and it's finished in less than four hours. And there's no smell when it runs. It's really quiet. It's actually really elegant, a simple design. And thanks to Lomi, I've gone from three bags of garbage every week to just one. I feel great knowing that I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. And now I've basically limitless supply of dirt for my garden. So it's awesome. It's a win-win situation for me and the environment. So if you want to start making a positive environmental impact, because Let's face it, those food scraps create methane when they break down in landfills, and methane is one of the biggest polluters that we have. So if you want to make cleanup after dinner easy, Lomi is perfect for you. Just head to Lomi.com slash Daily Beans. Use promo code Daily Beans, all one word. You'll get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com, L-O-M-I dot com slash Daily Beans, and use promo code Daily Beans at checkout. Food waste is gross. Lomi is your solution. And with the holidays just around the corner, Lomi will make the perfect gift for somebody on your shopping list. And as you know, I've had my Helix mattress for a long time now. It's been amazing. It's the best sleep I've ever had. And it's all because I'm using a mattress customized for the way I sleep. Helix has a fantastic lineup of 14 mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, ones for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. You can find which one is perfect by going to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and taking their two-minute online sleep quiz. They'll ship it right to your door free of charge. You'll get 100 sleeps risk-free to try it out. And if you decide it's not the best fit, you can return it for a full refund. They'll even pick it up. Every Helix mattress has a hybrid design. They combine individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support. Plus, Helix mattresses are made in the United States and they come with a 10 or 15-year warranty depending on the model. When I took the Helix online sleep quiz, I was matched with the Helix Midnight because, as you know, I am a side sleeper and I like a medium firm bed. So it's the best mattress I've ever owned. And right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash daily beans. That's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash daily beans. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am happy and honored today to be joined by my friend and host of the Living Through It podcast, one of the newest additions to the MSW media family, Elizabeth Cronise McLaughlin. Also, by the way, the author of one of the coolest books to come out in a really long time called Becoming Heroines. Everyone needs to pick it up. Elizabeth, hello. 
Hello. Thank you for having me back. As always, it's a joy to talk to you. You ha- It's so fun to introduce you because there's like 900 things I could say, you know, like Gaia Leadership <laughs> Project, Becoming Heroines, Live, you know, uh, Resistance Live, like so many things that you do and all the important work that you do. And congratulations, high five to both of us for and mm. uh, and everyone who listens to our shows and is in our in our little community corner of the world for stopping the red wave and uh, and and preserving democracy for another couple of years. So congrats. You too. I you know, I have to say it kind of makes it all worth it. I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've definitely been feeling the love this last few days from my community and the folks that I talk to on a regular basis. And, you know, we don't do it for that, it, but it's always nice to be seen. But I will just say that I think everybody who was on the ground door knocking and curing ballots, I know you were doing that work. I was door knocking for Katie Porter. I think everybody who's been out there doing that work in real time deserves huge applause and kudos because um, we'll make it through another two years, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Knock wood. Uh, thanks to all the work that everybody did. Yeah. And they and I believe they did just call the House yeah. for, for the Republicans. But I am, after I get off this call with you, going to continue to cure ballots in California's 41st district because we want to keep that margin as narrow as possible so that we can watch the bloodbath that will be the slim majority for House Republicans over the next two years. Yep. It's going to be... Um, there's going to be, we're going to, Biden's going to have to tap into the popcorn reserves as uh, Molly Jong Fast might say. So (laughs) I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the upcoming guests you have on Living Through It, because this is incredible. You actually tell us, tell us who we can expect to see and hear on your, on your podcast in the coming weeks. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I'm, I'm super excited that uh, next week, and this will drop the week after Thanksgiving, I am getting to interview Joaquin Castro. Uh, who I have been colleagues with for about four years now. Uh, He and I learned of each other and got to know each other a bit during a lot of the uh, immigration work that was underway during the Trump administration. And I am so excited to talk to him about Texas and what's happening in Texas. And Texas is a suppressed voting state. And also about some of the results in the districts that are along the border. Because I think what a lot of people don't realize is that a number of those districts right on the Mexican border actually went blue this time around. And there is some real progress being made in Texas generally in favor of the Democrats, notwithstanding the outcome of the governorship. So he's, you know, one of my favorite Congress people, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say and also to hearing what his thoughts are about what we're in for over the next couple of years and what the strategies are really going to be for Democrats and progressives vis-a-vis the House. So that's coming up uh, the week after Thanksgiving, and I'm super excited for that. We have Minda Hartz coming up next week, who many of you may know is the author of several books on racial trauma in the workplace. And uh, Minda has been a friend of mine for a really long time, also a very big supporter of Malcolm Kenyatta when he was running for the Senate in Pennsylvania. And so we have a lot to talk about in the context of, uh, you know, how you bring change to where you work. And what that looks like, uh, regardless of your identity. And Minda is somebody who is really committed to voting rights as well. And we talk about that in our interview. So that's going to be really delicious. And then finally, the week, the first full week in December, uh, we have the, the, uh, I don't even know what to call her, the the guru of all progressive messaging strategies, um, Anant Shankar Osorio, many of you will know from MSNBC and elsewhere, uh, who's going to talk about how we message for Yes, the next two years, but also ding, ding, ding. I can't believe we're already talking about this stuff. The 2024 presidential election. So she is, as as I think a lot of our listeners know, really one of the most respected voices on these sorts of things because she's very much about holding fast to what we believe in and not ceding any ground, but also convincing others of why our positions matter and make a difference in the lives of everyday Americans. She's a real straight shooter. I had a great opportunity to see her speak a few years ago, and it really altered my perspective even about the way I talk about looming fascism in America and all the other stuff that goes along with it and what we focus on. And so that will be a very juicy, almost year-end podcast for everybody to really sink their teeth into whether you're ready for the 2024 election cycle or not. Right. And, you know, I I had the honor of being able to speak with Anat as well. And her messaging strategies are so crucial. They were crucial in the midterms. And it's going to be so exciting to hear you speak to her after this midterm 
to see what we did right, uh, because this time we did a lot more right than we did wrong. <laughs> and, yeah. and to learn those best practices and really hone in on them going forward, because, you know, there were a lot of people who were telling Biden, look, you got to focus on crime and inflation. And Biden's like, no, fuck off. I'm going to do democracy and, 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 you know, individual rights and multicultural constitutional republic. And we're going to talk about voting rights. We're going to talk about these things that matter, people's rights. And 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 I think that that really sh- shocked and surprised a lot of uh, pundits and uh, quote unquote so-called experts that were not listening to to uh, to her messaging platform and her messaging um, messages about messaging, I guess, if you want to if you want to call it that. I wonder if she has like seminars on how to message about messaging. That would be interesting. That's super meta. Anyway, I'm going to I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, me too. And I'll tell you one other thing about it. You know, we had, we had Anand Giridharis on the podcast. I think it was like, you know, a few months, a few weeks ago now, I, very early on in the origination of my podcast. And Anand is featured prominently in Anand's book, The Persuaders, which I highly recommend because that is actually something of a masterclass on how we persuade others to get out there and care about our democracy. You know, I will say that I think one of the things that was really fascinating to me about the last few days of this cycle, and I'm really excited to ask Anat about this as well, is how many people poo-pooed that speech that Biden gave about the importance of democracy, right? Which to me was like so critical. Like, how could you not have a speech about the potential failure of American democracy in the days leading up to the election? And honestly, that seemed to me to fall right into what I'm familiar with from the context of Anat's strategies. So we'll see what she has to say about it. But obviously all the right-wing pundits who were like, what, what is this about? And even some of the moderate ones who I think didn't get it uh, now now really have something to answer for because obviously that speech landed exactly how and where it was supposed to in advance of the midterms. Yeah, that and it was a one-two punch, right? Because he did that a democracy speech a couple of days before the election. But you remember a few weeks back when he did what everyone called the red speech. And to me... What the what was genius about that, and I said it at the time, is it it really seems like the GOP was looking for an off ramp to to wiggle away from Donald Trump. And what that speech did was it coalesced the Republican Party behind Donald Trump because he was insulting semi-fascists and MAGA and ultra MAGA. And and what that felt like to me was, you know, the first punch was to get the Republican Party back tied with a cord of steel to Donald Trump and then come in with the two punch with the speech on democracy. And I really think that that progression and that messaging was just it was absolutely brilliant. And everyone's like, oh, the red lights and it's all creepy and da da da. And it's like, look, that was that that had an audience of not a big audience. That was for Donald Trump supporters, the Republican Party and Donald Trump, so that they would all get mad and get back on each other's side and defend. You, It forced Republicans to defend Donald Trump. And, and then he hit them with that democracy speech. And then and then the knockout punch was the was the midterm elections. We stopped that red wave. Yep. I, I think it I think it was really well thought through. And I have to say the the red speech to me holds a special place in my heart because I'm from right outside of Philadelphia. And so the the setup of that and the location of that and the messaging of that speech in the context of like the foundational location of American democracy also felt just really resonant from a symbolic standpoint. And then the fact that he had hecklers that he was responding to while it was going on which, you know, even in in the context of um, of that dynamic really set up in real time what we were facing down. Right. Um, And how he masterfully handled that at that moment. So, yeah, you know, we're I think the setup was good. And I think the question is, where are we going to be now for the next two years? And I I am fascinated, I will just say, by Pompeo's tweet today about Uh. backing away from people who are playing the victim and looking toward the past and you know, the planes flying over the announcement yesterday in support of Ron DeSantis, you know, I think they're going to eat each other alive and we're all going to have to witness the bloodbath. But I will say that provided we get our messaging right and we stay focused on the things that really matter to Americans and on the agenda that moves the country forward, hopefully all of that will inure to the benefit of the Democrats come 2024. Yeah. And and the MAGA wing of the Republican Party in Congress, in the House now, will not be able to stop itself from doing its MAGA shit. And that is going to have the impact of a, a, a Joe Biden red speech for the next, you know, year and a half while we lead up to the 2024 election. They're going to do a lot of the work for us. And it's going to be really fascinating to see because 
the American voters clearly rejected that kind of bullshittery this time around in the midterms. And they're not going to be able to keep away from it with the with the Marjorie Taylor Greens getting gavels and shit like that. So it's going to be very fascinating to watch. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to these upcoming interviews you have. And speaking of books, we were talking about the authors you have coming up. Tell us about your book, where people can get it and where people can follow you. Oh, yeah. Well, you can get Becoming Heroines anywhere. So uh, you can order it off of Amazon. Not that I ordinarily recommend that, but any of your independent booksellers can get it from you. It's on the Penguin Random House portfolio imprint, and you can just Google Becoming Heroines and you will find it. It was one of Amazon's um, best nonfiction books for 2021. So fairly easy to find that anywhere. And of course, you can find me on the Living Through It podcast, our Patreon feed, which gets you episodes ad-free and or a day early is patreon.com slash living through it. And of course, I have this, what is now officially, I was just notified yesterday, one of Substack's top selling uh, and top subscribed written newsletters on Substack, which is the newsletter with ECM. So if you Google that, you will find it. And that's where I really write long form stuff on politics and survival and coping with trying times and all that other sort of good stuff. So yeah, and then I have a website, but you know, it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, you, well, like I said, you're kind of everywhere. So, mm-hmm. and Elizabeth, we are going to be doing a joint episode on the election and we're going to, we're going to air it on the beans on Friday after Thanksgiving, because we'll be off, but we're going to, we're going to re- record that. And uh, you and I will just be given our thoughts on what, what, you know, what went down in the weeds uh, during this midterm. And perhaps what we can look forward to, you know, that we just talked about (laughs) when we get closer to 2024 with the announcement of Donald Trump running for president again that nobody really watched and everybody sort of made fun of. It's going to be a fascinating episode. So I, everybody that'll be coming out the day after Thanksgiving. And uh, that's going to be a fun chat, my friend. Yes, I'm really looking forward to it. We will, we will riff on all things upcoming and uh, including the potential implosion of the GOP. Which is going to be awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Elizabeth Cronise McLaughlin, host of Living Through It. We'll be right back with the good news. Woke AF Daily is your much needed wake up call in a weary world. Get woke with my bevy of special guests from the worlds of news and politics, arts, entertainment, and spirituality. Where else can you start the conversation on the latest headlines and end on the importance of rest and mindfulness? Where else can you hear a sitting member of Congress one day and a practicing yogi the next? Where else can you take in the world filtered through the powerful voice of a black queer woman? Where else but Woke AF Daily with me, Danielle Moody. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play What the Mutt, Find the Cat, How? tell me how stu- stupid Louis Gohmert is. Uh, if you want to... Uh, first of all, I'm getting better at what the mutt. And I feel like we've been, we've had had like a drop off. So if you have a shelter pup and you want to send it in and see if I can kind of do my best to guess what breeds make up your shelter pup. I love doing that. If you have a whoopee story, if you want to give a shout out to somebody you love, you want to give a shout out to a small business, you can do it all by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. First up from VE pronouns she and her. I found out that my auntie Gabe was the original nasty woman. Oh, and she faced down Trump, who was trying to open a golf course. This may sound made up and all out of the blue, except I told this story to my table in the nursing home. And one of my ladies flat out told me she remembered that court victory on her side over the radio. (laughs) So anyway, she died in May ish of 2012 ish. And we celebrate her passing by having a piece of her favorite dessert, a slice of cherry pie and a scoop of vanilla ice cream. I have the pie filling and coconut ice cream, by the way heart. Thank you, VE. That's awesome. Yeah, I I actually found out from my mom recently that she helped prevent Trump from building in Palm Springs and that, quote, that fucker still owes me $10,000. Next up from Susie Creates, pronouns she and her. Follow up, Susie Creates cosplay, the Wonder Woman costume. Ah, yes, that was seen in my previous submissions was actually gifted to me by an incredible cosmaker friend of mine, Laura Kionley, and she's in Colombia. It was an upgraded version to the one that I made myself, so I cannot take credit for the absolutely amazing costume she made. But as my name suggests, I am a cosplay maker. That is my hobby a few nights a week, creating costumes to wear for fun, for conventions, for charity visits. 
I got into building costumes because I'm six feet tall and hated the quality of costumes found at Halloween stores. I learned almost everything I know from YouTube and failing forward along the way. I study all sources of reference images, usually superhero movies, break them down and figure the patterning out and engineering them. I've also made props. Now attached are a few collages of the numerous costumes I have made and one collage of the stages of the process. I have a significant urge to make Amazons and powerful women. Although I enjoy making costumes, what you see is three years of building. I also try to limit taking on one to two commissions per year from close friends in the community. My current projects since May of this year are Mighty Thor, Jane Foster, who wields Mjolnir, (laughs) Captain Marvel of the MCU, as well as finishing up a costume commission for a friend as Mary Marvel from the movie Shazam 2, coming out in March of next year. Thank you so much for the compliments on my favorite nerdy hobby. These are great. Oh, yeah, I can see the process now. I can see the building process. These are truly, truly incredible. So my favorite thing to dress up for at Comic-Con is Power Girl. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in chatting, Susie, we could talk about a Power Girl costume. I have the boots. All right, next up from Anonymous, pronouns she and her. Good morning. I have been getting a kick out of the recent spate of cascading mispronunciations. My kids were notorious for saying words wrong when they were little, and honestly, to this very day, but less frequently, probably because they were avid readers and encountered words they'd never heard, so they just guessed and went with it. One of my favorite examples of this was when we were seeing the sights in D.C. One of my kids said something about the, the pot um, Potomac River, rhymes with atomic, Potomac, but with a short O sound. The other responded, that's how you say it? I thought it was Potomac. <laughs> Stress on the first syllable, Potomac. <laughs> Long O sound. That's so fucking awesome. Mine were much simpler. Uh, I I remember when I first heard the word awry versus having seen it so many times and thinking it was awry. So my pet tax is Dover. He's kind of an asshole, but we love him dearly. (laughs) He's a Ned cat. It's his beautiful gray and white tabby. Absolutely lovely. Thank you. Next up from Carrie, pronouns she and her. A good news story I don't think is getting enough attention is the Maine governor's race. If you remember, Maine was plagued by a horrible governor named Paul LePage for eight years, from 2011 to 2019. He was famous for picking fights with the ACLU and everybody else, making incredibly racist comments and generally being an embarrassment to our state. When he was governor, LePage vowed to veto every bill sponsored by a Democrat, regardless of its merits. That was in retaliation for Democrats not supporting his push to eliminate the state's income tax. He was a small, vindictive little man. He himself bragged that he was Trump before Trump. Ah, yes, I remember now. In 2019, Democrat Janet Mills, Maine's first woman governor, took office. In this election, Paul LePage was her challenger. He came back to Maine from Florida, where he had moved in order to fulfill his dream of not paying income tax (laughs) and probably to be closer to his orange crush. Despite having to govern through a pandemic in her first term and having a large vocal part of the state calling for her impeachment, along with even worse, more violent outcomes, Janet Mills won this election by a 13 point margin. She won with 55 and a half percent of the vote. LePage never even got 50 percent of the vote the two times he was elected. To me, this seems right up there with importance with the gubernatorial races in Michigan and Pennsylvania. In some ways, it's even a closer test case for Trump running for reelection in 2024 because LePage had previously served as governor and is still very popular with his base. But he failed. Maine sent him back to Florida. Sorry, Florida. And hopefully he'll stay there. Thank you for all you do. I've been a listener since the early days. You're an important part of my mornings. As I get ready to teach third grade, thank you for your service. I don't have any pet tax for you today, but if you can picture a high-strung black lab mix with that howls every time my teenager plays the piano, you have a good idea of what my house sounds like. AG, your personal story has been an inspiration to me in ways I can't describe right now. Just know that hearing your voice, strong, smart, funny, confident, and kind, gives me a little bit of strength every day. DG, I'm so glad you're part of this empowering dream team. Love to you both. That is so sweet, Carrie. Thank you so much for those kind words. And if you ever get a video of the dog howling to the piano, I need to see it. Next up from Stacy, pronoun she and her. I agree with your comments the other day crediting Gen Z for the election results. I just wanted to add shout out to my fellow Gen X parents. A big fucking cheers to us. One for seeing through the bullshit, rejecting racism, misogyny, homophobia, etc. Two, for acknowledging the generational traumas and ongoing healing processes. And I have a feeling I've read this one before. I love this submission, but I'm going to keep going anyway. 
also for teaching our children to know better, be better, and do better. They saved us this election. Our mothers and grandmothers would be proud AF. Thanks for all you do. Your show is a favorite coping mechanism. Pairs well with my morning coffee. Added a photo of our Lucy in her Batgirl costume for your viewing pleasure. And yes, Stacy, you got your submission read twice because I absolutely love it. And uh, I wasn't going to correct myself on this because I always love to see Lucy in her Batgirl costume. Everybody, if you have any good news, pet tax photos, Halloween photos, any pets dressed up in costumes, holiday photos, dogs on Santa's lap, uh, what the mutt, anything you want to play, any good news stories, any confessions or corrections, especially on pronunciations, please send them to me at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. Dana will be back tomorrow. Uh, Until then, everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.